Hi, welcome to lecture 3 inertial navigation system. In this lecture we are going to talk about how inertial navigation system or INS is working, what is its component and uh, we are also going through the common source of errors in INS and how we can uh, resolve those errors or make sure that we are avoiding them. We are talking about different reference frames in inertial navigation system and how we can transform from one reference frame to another. At the end, we are talking about navigation process and principle of Kalman filter. The first question is, what is inertial navigation system and why we need to know about that as a surveyor? The answer is very simple. Nowadays, we are using the mobile scanning and unmanned aerial vehicles or UAV, which taking observation while they are moving. So we somehow need to get their uh, orientation as well as their position. So INS allows the surveyor to know the position and orientation of their instrument at any given time when an observation is made. INS uh, are made of two parts basically. The first part is inertial measurement unit which is made up of three accelerometers and three orthogonal gyroscopes. So they're located in um, on three orthogonal axes like pitch roll yeah, or XYZ. I'm talking about the reference frame of the instrument itself. Another unit is GNSS. Uh, so when we combine IMU and GNSS together, we can call it inertial navigation system. So we are not even talking about the orientation of the instrument. We are also talking about its position. So the last piece of puzzle is some clever mathematics that allows the INS to integrate position observation of high quality but low temporal resolution of GNSS with position calculation of low air quality but high temporal resolution of IMU. This mathematical tool is called Kalman filter, which we are going to talk about that at the end of this lecture. Let's have a look how inertial system is working. To start off, we are looking at gyroscope motion first. If you have a bicycle or bike, you might have noticed that the high speed is easier to lean the bike in one direction than it is in the other. This is the example of the gyroscopic motion. A simple example of this phenomenon can be shown in the figure on the right hand side. Consider a heavy disc of mass M. So our heavy disc has a mass of M, which create the gravitational force of Mg, in this case, shown by green vector. And then this gravitational force if multiplied by the distance from the center to the center of the disk, if I call it R, can create the torque, which is the rotational force. So I can say torque is equal to distance times force. When both ends are supported, the gravity vector is balanced by the support, your hand maybe. And because nothing is rotating, the total angular momentum of the system is zero. When one support, just imagine you're removing your hand, the gravitational vector no longer has a balance. So there is a torque perpendicular to the gravity. So this torque will be created in the direction of the red vector. This causes an increase in the angular momentum, which is again perpendicular to the uh, torque and gravitational force. and this progresses so it rotates faster until it hits the ground or the stand. Now consider what will happen if the heavy disc is now rotated around its axis at high speed. So, so far we're just rotating at a normal speed. But if I'm rotating the, head, the wheel fast and then you remove your hand, you will see that it's rotating around its uh, O, which is the pivot point. So let's have a look one more time. So the guy is rotating the wheel fast and then it free his hands. So the angular momentum caused the wheel to rotate around. Oh, in this case, it's going to look like this. 
This phenomenon is called gyroscopic precession. This concept can be applied to the gyroscope and can explain how gyroscope is working in inertial navigation system. Now let's have a look at the gyroscope. Gyroscope has different types. The first type is rotating wheel. The rotating wheel system used a rotating wheel which is uh, freely can rotate around the x-axis. It also has uh, two concentric orthogonal gimbals as shown in the figure. The wheel was allowed to spin freely around the x-axis, the inner gimbal to spin around the y-axis and the outer one to a spin around the z-axis. If the object is strapped to the body of a moving object, then whenever it rotates, the gyroscope attempts to conserve the angular momentum. What does it mean is this image here. So as you can see, the uh, wheel is rotating around the x-axis. It's also creating the momentum. But what gyroscope does, trying to conserve uh, the angular momentum by rotating around the y and z axis and you can see that the wheel is kind of sta stationary on its axis, spin axis basically. So if we can measure the tilt of the y and z axis then we can measure the rotation around the axis of the um, x in this example. So if you have two gyroscopes orthogonal to the axis of uh, our instrument, uh, say roll pitch yaw, if you have two of them, on one on the x axis initially vertical and another one uh, on the y axis initially horizontal, then we can combine them together to measure all three rotations along the three axes. The second type of gyroscopes uh, are optical systems. The great advantages of optical system over the rotating wheel is they are more simpler and also they don't need to have moving parts. They can be divided in two different types, ring laser gyroscopes and fiber optic gyroscopes. Let's start from ring laser gyroscope. A ring laser gyroscope using a laser, and like any other type of laser, the gas is excited by a flow of electrons and emit. So we have a light source which emit the lights, obviously going in two different direction. If you are staying stationary, these two lights should be detected by photo detector at the same time. So there is no difference between them. So it means that there is no rotation along that axis. But if you are moving in this case, if you are rotating anticlockwise, for example, then the photo detector receives your light with a time delay, which can be expressed as the shift in the frequency of the light. So if you can calculate that, you can convert it to the uh, rotation around that axis. So it can measure the rotation. So if you have three mutually orthogonal ring laser are fabricated in a singular piece of glass to cover the three axis, then we can measure the rotation along the three axis. One thing we need to be considered is we have some mirrors here which are reflecting the light obviously. We have one here which is obviously lets uh, the light to pass through and can be detected by photo detector. But because none of these mirrors are perfect, they will backscatter some of the lights and this leads to an inability to measure a very slow rotation speeds. So this is the systematic error which can be solved either by adding moving parts to the gyroscope or by using a magneto-optic uh, approach. In addition, uh, there is another systematic error related to this system, which is due to the flow of the laser gas within the ring causes biases in the calculation of angular rate. 
Both of these effects introduce systematic errors in the measurement of the rotation by the gyroscope. What is the third one? It is fiber optic gyroscope. So fiber optic gyroscope is very thin optical fibers uh, that basically consist of a several kilometer of optical fiber which are rounded around a cylindrical spool and is following the same rule in this case a light source has its beam split in a half again and then it is sent it oppos in opposite direction down the optical fiber and then when it comes to the other end it's sent to the photo detector if the fiber is stationary in the inertial space then the two beams will interfere destructively and no light will be detected by the detector but if there is a rotation this will not happen and the light detected at the photo detector will be proportional to the rate of the rotation the next part of inertial measurement unit is accelerometers accelerometers basically measure the acceleration as easy as this but they do also have different types. The first type is Pendulous Integrating Gyroscopic Accelerometers, or PIGA. In this device, as you can see, there is a gyroscope hung by a pendulum within the device, so the spin axis of gyroscope is perpendicular to the input axis desired for the device. So, the basic principle behind, behind this accelerometer is the utilization of the torque. The torque of the gyroscope is used to counter the torque caused by the pendulum and the acceleration applied to it. The second type of accelerometers is proof mass. So proof mass accelerometers uses a mass that is connected to a damper and a spring as shown in the figure. When a force acts on the accelerometers, the device moves in the direction of the force, but the mass remains where it is due to its inertia. This means that this spring here will be extended to the proportional of the strength of the force. So if the force is larger, it's going to be expanded more. So if it's less, it's going to be expanded less, obviously. The damping here is used to smooth out the harmonic motion that is expected from the spring and mass system. The last type of the accelerometers is vibrating a string which is consists of the metal tape, a mass and some magnets around the uh, frame of that. In this case, changing of electron magnets are used to set up a vibration in the metal tape. When the system is accelerated, the mass does not move, so this ma mass remains constant as before, and decrease in the tension of one side, causing an increase in the tension of the other side. This has the effect on changing of vibration frequency in the middle tape, and the difference in the squares of the frequency will be proportional to the force. Like any other measurement devices we have in survey, IMU also suffers from number of errors. They can be categorized in four types, which we are going to uh, talk about each of them individually, BIOS, scale factor, cross-coupling, and random noise. Each of these four types can also have different contribution, which is the fixed contribution, temperature dependent, run-to-run -run variation, and in-run variation. I'm going to define each of these terms individually. What is fixed term? Fixed component is always there, so we always have a fixed component of the error, but the good thing about that, we can eliminate this fixed contribution using the calibration. Even if you want to minimize the cost of calibration, you can drive the coefficient or calibration coefficient for one sensor and then you can apply it to the others. Again, remember, if you want to have optimal accuracy, you want to calibrate those sensors individually. But if you want to minimize the cost, you always have the option to apply the calibration coefficient to all of those sensors. Another element is temperature dependent. What is temperature dependent elements? 
uh, like any other device that we are calibrating, uh, we know, for example, if you are calibrating your total station, you are doing the calibration in a specific temperature. Same thing will apply to the sensor of inertial measurement unit. So all sensors are calibrated at a specific temperature and will have correction parameters applied to make allowance for temperature variation. So what happens if we don't apply that? You're going to have the systematic error introduced in the first few minutes until you reach the operating temperature. So you have to be careful about that. It's better to measure the temperature and correct it. The third contribution is run-to-run -run variation. Run-to-run -run variation, uh, unfortunately, is not something that you can fix it in the calibration process because it's changing every time that you switch on the instrument. So it can be estimated and corrected by using the startup procedure that we're going to discuss about that later. Lastly, in run variation, uh, can change with the time while you are using the device. There is no way that you can correct this error by initialization or calibration. They can only be allowed or eliminated by integration of IMU and GNSS. Now let's talk about different types of the error. And then we are going through each of the contribution for each of these type of the error. First one is BIOS. BIOS is the constant error. So it's the constant error between the true value and measured value. If you imagine the true value is the solid line you have here and the measured value is the dashed line, BIOS is the constant uh, difference between them. It can be positive or it can be negative. It means that you either uh, over-reading or under-reading uh, and that's why it can define the positive or negative BIOS. If I want to give you an example, BIOS is pretty much like your index error or zero constant in EDM calibration, so it's the constant number. So it can be easily uh, fixed. If you want to fix, it's like an offset, you have to add or subtract and get the BIOS removed. With the accelerometers and gyros, we have two types of biases. The first one is fixed bias or turn on bias, which is different every time you turn on the uh, instrument. It's going to be different for each of those six sensors. Uh, it's constant during the run, but as I said, whenever you're turning on, uh, you're going to have different number. Uh, it also have uh, some leftover error from the calibration, which you need to take into account. The other type of the bias is called dynamic bias, which is still an additive value, but it has in-run variability. Uh, what was in-run variation? It was uh, changing over the time by using the instrument. So normally it's expected that dynamic bias is approximately 10% of the size of the fixed bias. But remember, you have to also add a little bit of error left over from the temperature correction to the uh, dynamic bias. The next error is the scale factor, which is pretty much like a scale factor in the EDM uh, calibration. Consider the previous Im image, we see that even if we're removing even if we are removing the bias, there is a still difference between the slope of the true value and measured value as you can see in the figure. So that is because the slope of the dashed line is somewhat less than 1, because true value is 1 by 1. In the absence of bias, but the presence of scale factor, the error associated with the measurement uh, is going to be twice as large if the measurement is twice as large of the original. So it's basically changing the scale. How about cross-coupling? Cross-coupling is coming from the alignment issue. So in reality, we are trying to put our sensor in, in line with the orthogonal axis of the instrument. But no matter how far manufacturers are trying, they can't exactly align the sensor with the orthogonal axis of the instrument. Now, how is going to affect our measurement? 
If the instrument is sensitive, like if you have a sensitive accelerometer in axis 1 and it's not orthogonal to axis 2, what's happening is it's sensing acceleration on axis 2 as well. So it's going to give you uh, measurements which are not correct. Same thing with gyroscope. If you have a sensitive gyros, then they will sense the rotation around the other axis as well, which is not true. The last type of error are random noise. Unfortunately, random noise cannot be corrected or calibrated. They can only be estimated and deal with uh, statistically. So, uh, what is random noise? Uh, the example of random noise uh, is basically the systematic error that I've talked about them in uh, ring laser gyroscope. So, like for example, you might have the uh, flow of the gas laser changing the frequency of your uh, emitted light which create the noise and systematic error in the gyros. In this bit we are talking about the reference frame. In INS we do have different type of reference frame. We know two of them from surveying so far. So the first one is airspeak, air centric, you know the, the center of this is center of the mass of the Earth, then Z axis along the rotation of the Earth, X is passing from Greenwich, and Y is orthogonal uh, to the other two. Then we can have a local ge geodetic, which in our case might be GDA 94 at the moment and GDA 2020 soon. So if we call the S for fixed air-centric A-frame and then local geodetic, we call it G-frame. We have three new reference frames in INS that you might not have heard of them. The first one is inertial frame. The difference between the air-centric air-fixed reference frame and inertial frame is they both have the rotation of the Earth as a z-axis but their x and y are slightly different. How is different for the inertial reference frame? We're assuming that the x, fact, x axis is orthogonal to the rotation of the f, is no longer passing through the Greenwich. And the other one, y obviously is orthogonal to the other two, which can be any arbitrary point. Here's the point. As the Earth is rotating, this reference frame also is changing, so it's dynamic, it's not fixed. So you might you might have one point fixed on Earth centric Earth fixed reference frame, which has a coordinate. But if you want to convert it to the inertial frame, you will see that the coordinates in the inertial frame is changing because Earth is rotating and that coordinate also is changing. The next two reference frames are related to the instrument. The first one is body frame. So if you have like a car or if you have a UAV or anything, they do have their own reference frame, which we call it body frame or B frame in here. Then we have the sensor frame. The sensor frame are not always exactly aligned with the body frame. Uh, so the frame defines the plane of X and Y accelerometers with the X axis aligned with the axis of the accelerometers is called the sensor frame, which we call it S frame here. Now let's have a look at the frame transformation. Imagine that you have two reference frames, I and J, and they are sharing the same Z axis, pretty much like Earth-centric, Earth-fixed, and inertial reference frame. Then, the relationship between two points in two different reference frames, in this case this point, in this reference frame, and the other reference frame, can be expressed by the angle of alpha, which is the rotation around the z axis. So the equation can be written as this one. So the component of the arm in the reference frame I 
transformed by rotation into frame J, which is alpha, can be written as this equation. This is normally shown in a matrix form as is this one, and it is called directional cosine matrix or DCM. So, for two reference frame, I and J, which are related by the rotation around X, Y, and Z axis. So this is rotation around X, this is rotation around Y axis, and this is rotation around Z. If we combine these three together, I can write the rotation matrix to transform the point from reference frame I to reference frame J, I can write it as this one. As you can see, theta is the rotation around X, uh, psi is rotation around Z, phi is rotation around Y. If you assume that the angles are very small, and if you, if you substitute this value into this matrix, you can luckily simplify this matrix into this one. The rays will be used to use in vectors in terms of line in three-dimensional space, but they are generally applicable for other purposes as well. For a vector A, which is x, y, z, and its magnitude is uh, can be written as, so I can write its magnitude as squared of its element, and this is the absolute value. For two vector a and b, the dot product can be written as this one, the cross product as we know can be written as this one. It is possible to create a matrix to represent a. It is possible to create a matrix to represent a uh, so that when it's multiplied with the b gives the same result as the cross product we have here. This is called Skoi symmetric matrix and takes the form of this matrix at the end. Now we want to use this Skoi symmetric matrix in the previous formula we have here. See whether we can convert it to a Skoi symmetric matrix and how it's going to look like. So, so far we know if we have a small angle, we can write our rotation between two reference frames of body and geodetic as this one here. Now using the Skoi symmetric system, we can write this one like this.